I've met most of you already. Uh, welcome again. It's wonderful to be chatting to you and just presenting on, on separating the sizzle from the steak. And I think what we need to understand about this topic is that sizzle comes in many forms when we invest. And I think it's important that we consider that not only is sizzle something that happens in the marketplace, but we as individuals create our own sizzle in our behavior. So I'm going to be talking quite a bit about the market in general, uh, dealing with managers, specialists, and also about our behavior and how that affects us. So let's start off and let's have a look at a few schemes, you could call it, that had a lot of sizzle and a lot of allure and created a lot of emotion in us. Um, the first one was Mr. Madoff, Bernie Madoff on the left there. We've heard of the Madoff Ponzi scheme. Some of us might not have. Bernie Madoff was a man of stature. In fact, he was the chairman of the NASDAQ at one point. He created a lot of allure in the marketplace through his trading. At one point in time, his business actually was trading 740 million on average a day. And that was about 9% of the, the total stock market, New York Stock Exchange in, in, in the US. So he was a credible man. His business started in the 1960s. Uh, he, you know, he was a man that you would have followed. You would have believed in him. Uh, at a certain point in time, he decided that, I think, greed took over. And he decided he would start his scheme. And I think maybe initially it wasn't meant to be a scheme, but he targeted charities, foundations in, in the U.S., in the USA, if you are a charity, there's a law that says you have to pay out 5% of your capital every year. So by targeting them, he knew that he only ever would be asked for 5%. And so, I mean, you think about it, every billion, you're paying out 50 million, you can go for 20 years without any return on your investment. So that was what he, he did. In the end, it was quite scary because the fraud level was 64.8 billion and 4,800 different clients were affected by this. Where he was very clever is he had this brokerage firm running, you know, on the side and it was, it was a legitimate business, but he never paid anyone an excessive return. It was always around 10%, almost surprisingly around 10%, consistently too much so. So at certain points in time, people started saying, now hold on, the market's so volatile, how's this working? And I think that is when people started to look. But the biggest thing was People were so scared to get out of the out of the investment because of this consistent return. He was unapproachable. No one could ever meet him. So he created this complete allure. He was arrested in December 2008. And he was, he was sentenced to 150 years. It's very sad because some of his family were involved. And there were tragic outcomes with his family. Um, but he actually admitted in his plea bargain that he had not traded since the mid-90s. So that's how long he had been going for. So there's a man that, honestly, when you started out, you probably would have followed. You know, he was, he was a decent stock brokerage. The second is the Tenenbaum scheme. Now, some of us might not have heard about that, uh, Barry Tenenbaum. Once again, a credible background in terms of his grandfather having been the co-founder of Adcock Ingram. So what Barry Tenenbaum did was he went out to people and he said, listen, give me your money and I'll pay you 15% every quarter. Now, for a lot of us, that's going to raise alarm bells immediately, but people didn't, you know, they, they jumped in. In fact, many ex-CEOs jumped in, and they might have jumped in out of greed, maybe, or necessity, you know, but he paid 15% a quarter, but the, he, it was on the premise that you were investing money towards the raw material that goes into AIDS drugs. So there was that emotional, oh, I think I'm doing something good here. Along, along with the fact that you're getting you know, that 60% a year, which is just insane. So once again, credibility in the background. And quite hard initially, I think for most of us, if you've been offered 15%, for a lot of people, they would go, hold on. And this is what this whole talk is about tonight, is to say, how do we, we identify when something is really out of kilter or when it's not illegal, but there's misinformation, there's aggressive accounting being applied, or you just misunderstood information. This I'm talking about here is illegal stuff, but we're going to talk a little bit further on. Shamex property scheme. The numbers are variable. I'm, we're not 100% sure of how many people were affected by Shamex, uh, but it's around 33,000 people. It's about 4.4 billion. And Shamex, what their allure was, 
was to, or their sizzle and the emotional appeal was, first of all, they paid huge commissions to the people that were selling. And secondly, they paid a way above average market interest rate initially to the investors. So that would have pulled people in. And unfortunately, a lot of retired people were caught up in share max. And, they, and that was probably necessity. Uh, you know, they went in because they needed that, that interest. It isn't over yet. And in fact, Tenenbaum's not over yet. Uh, you know, that's still going on. There's many schemes that exist right now. Um, in fact, there's probably the biggest one is unfolding at the moment. Um, Belvedere, and if you, if you go onto MoneyWeb, you might find out about it. There's a, there's a number that are possibly unfolding. So very important to understand that it's not always as easy as you think to avoid this kind of thing if you, if you get emotionally hooked by it. Uh, very important to, 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 to keep your wits about you. If we look at, if we move on from that and we now look at not a, not, not a legal activity, just activity that happens in the marketplace where you don't have enough information and you make a decision. The honest truth is the best of specialists get caught out and we're going to identify how that happens. But if you look at this slide, and I, I'm just going to explain to you briefly, uh, I've used this slide before because it's very powerful. I'm just going to explain to you what it really is talking about. If on the vertical axis, you'll see CAPE ratio. CAPE is what, then, what is known as cyclically adjusted price earnings. Okay, uh, It is a derivative of price earnings. Price earnings itself, what that is, is just a multiple. And what you're trying to identify is a multiple uh, amount you're prepared to pay, a number you're prepared to pay of earnings uh, uh, based on last year's uh, earnings um, under current price. Now, the historical average PE is about 16. Let's call it that. Okay, And the CAPE ratio is around that too. But CAPE ratio looks back at seven years of earnings, not one year. Your normal PE only looks back one year. Your, your cyclically adjusted price earnings looks back at seven years of earnings. It averages it out, inflates it, and puts it under current price. And that's a far better indicator of the DNA of a stock because it's been through a life cycle. What, you, what we need to understand about the slide more so is the, the red line is the mean. So I spoke about the mean being about 16 worldwide average. So what you're saying is it effectively takes you about 16 years to pay for the price of your stock and the earnings. And that's what the market average it out is. Anything way above that is expensive. You're paying too much. And anything below that, you want to start looking at the share because it's attractive. It's below the average. And this gray line shows you the one-year trailing price earnings. And the green line is a cyclically adjusted. The gray line in 2008, all right, remember we had the financial crisis in 2008. If you were only following one-year price earnings, last year's earnings under current price, you would have thought the market was only at fair price. You know, it was worth buying. It was worth holding, hanging on, maybe even buying there. But if you'd looked at the cyclically adjusted price earnings, it told you that the market was very overpriced. Price had run far ahead of earnings, and there was this gap. So, okay, specialists would have understood this. You know, they would have identified that. And, sorry, can you see? Are you okay? Uh, uh, you know, I think this is information that's standard information available to people, but you've got to ask for it, and you've got to know where to go to find it. And specialists get caught. Uh, if we look at uh, a recent incident last year, Pinnacle Technologies is a stock. Great company. In April last year, one of the directors was accused of fraud. And at the same time, the directors were accused of insider trading because they took three weeks to announce the fraud. Both, of that, both cases have been cleared, but the stock has not recovered. It was a 24-round randish stock. It's been down to seven rand. It's sitting at just, I think it's, it's just over 10 rand at the moment. So that's something that we as asset managers are going to be affected by. We, we, I mean, a lot of asset managers were affected by that. And the secret there is, we'll talk about it later, how do you avoid that? Because we are also going to be caught by that kind of thing. The construction industry is another story. Uh, if, you, if you remember before the World Cup, Construction companies were the flavor. Quite, quite scary what's happening now when we hear what's, what's happened to the World Cup. But you'll see there that the CAPE ratios, the cyclically adjusted PE ratios in 2007 were through the roof for those companies. So in other words, price had run, earnings were, you know, wasn't keeping up. And uh, I think that's an indicator for, for the asset management industry because we would have seen that and said, okay, you know, these stocks are probably looking expensive. 
But what happened with this, this industry is they were accused of colluding. We know this. And in fact, it was the, the single largest fine hand, handed out to one industry by the Competition Commission, 1.46 billion in fine to 15 different companies. It's not over because I believe the municipalities might be looking at the fact that they paid a bit too much for their stadiums. Uh, you know, that might just be, you know, in, in the future. So that's <clears throat> something where, you know, where you can, you can buy into sizzle quite easily. Look, where the, well, look in 2013 where these CAPE ratios fell to. So in other words, price had dropped. Um, now, now let's look at this. Because this is, okay, even though it's not specifically related to that, look at the stocks on this slide and see where their CAPE ratio is sitting. I'm not talking about, I'm not associating them with any issues. Uh, that happened in the construction industry at all. I'm just showing you that there's the market average cyclically adjusted PE. There's these stocks sitting with PEs almost going through the roof. Okay, Nuspers and Asper, and Mr. Price, great companies, excellently run, um, great propositions, but prices run strongly. So is there sizzle there? You have to decide that. If you're going to invest, what risk do you take? You know, when you when you do it. Um, do you know this information? You know, uh, go and look, research it. Make sure you, you you're identifying it. Ask ask for the information. Try and find people that will help you. And specialists will do that. So, you know, it's important that we understand that in our industry, even the best also have problems with sizzle. <laughs> we get caught out at times, and that's why we asset allocate. And um, that's that's why we allocate across the board in portfolios. Uh, to mitigate those possible, you know, problems. Now let's talk about ourselves and how we behave and what sizzle we can create. Uh, if you look at the biases that we have, and there are many biases that we have in our behaviour, but if you if you if you start to identify them, it'll start helping you realise where you get in your own way at times. Um, and I think the, the, the best way to start is for me to ask you a question. And the question is, how many of you in this room believe that you're an above average driver? <laughs> I think the others are scared <laughs> because they wanted to put up their hands. In fact, this, this, was, this uh, study was done um, in America and it was a large sample size, a large group of people and they were asked the question and 93% of the people said they were above average. So mathematically, that's impossible. 93% said that they're above. What I should have done is said, close your eyes and put your hands up because more people would have. You didn't want to see each other. And that's what we call overconfidence bias. Okay, so we get into the share market, we start doing well, and maybe we get a bit overconfident. So, so that's something that has to be managed. Anchoring bias is a very interesting uh, bias because it doesn't have any sort of logical form to it or, or reason or backing to it. Really what it is, is you anchor around a certain number, a certain subject, and it, does, it has no relation to what you're making your decision on. And I'll, and I'll tell you how this was worked out. Dan O'Reilly in 2003 did a study. And his study was, he sat down with a, a large group of American people and he said, right, I want you to write down on a piece of paper the last two numbers in your social security number. Just write them down. Then he said to them, right, look at these objects, and he showed them pictures of uh, milk, cheese, you know, just standard things you buy in a day, but not in the packaging they know. And he said, right, would you be interested in buying these? And he got them their buy-in. And then he said, oh, okay, I want you to bid, um, you know, your, your, the, the, the pricing of it. And interestingly enough, the bids by the people that had the, the higher numbers in their social security numbers, so the larger numbers, their bids were 60 to 120% higher than the others. It's illogical, isn't it? But that's literally what it, it came out as. And I was reading in my research for this, uh, restaurants have, not all of them, we were speaking about restaurants in Durban, not all of them do, but restaurants often employ people who are professional menu writers. Because there's psychology in a menu. And what they, what they do is, apparently, 
the right hand corner top right hand corner of a, of a menu menu the first page is prime real estate it's where your eye goes to first so what those restaurants often do is they'll put their most expensive item up there in fact their most insanely expensive item up there so that all the others appear cheap that's the one way they do it the other way is they put their most profitable um, uh, uh, item of food in that corner there's all anchors we, we see it all the time if you think about a property price you know you you might go and someone says I want two and a half million that's the base price that's the anchor that you set around it it's actually worth one and a half you get it down to two and you hey, I did well you know so those are the kinds of things you go into markets where you're bargaining let's say you go into a market a leather market and you're trying to buy a belt there's always an anchor price set there so Anchoring is an important thing that we need to understand because it is a bias that we, we have. Loss aversion bias is something that's very important for us to understand because all of these things can lead us to buying for the wrong reasons. Loss aversion bias, if we lose a thousand rand versus gaining a thousand rand, we feel twice as much pain in losing as we do joy in gaining. That's just the way it is. And that forces us actually to hold on to things for too long. And also, we were talking, I was talking with Simon earlier, at the price if you, that you bought it at, if you have to try and sell it at that, you don't want to because now you've become attached to it and you don't want to lose. You need, you, in your mind, you are going to gain. So loss aversion bias is something very important for us to understand. It stops us, if we can manage that, it stops us from hanging on too long or getting out too early you know, in an investment. And then status quo bias, I want it to stay as it is. I don't want it to change. Please don't force me to make this decision. I don't want it to change in any way. Uh, and, you know, interestingly enough, um, the, in, in Germany and Austria, just to give you an idea of how status quo bias, how strong it is, it's how you position something. In, in Germany, you have an opt-in option for organ donation. So you can choose to donate your organs, and only 12% of the, the people that die choose that. In, in, in Austria, it's the other way around. You have to opt out. 99% of the people don't opt out. How's that? Or well, how's the logic in that? <laughs> it's how it's positioned to you. So that's a very important factor about how we, how we are as people and what we need to understand in terms of you know, our makeup. And perception, I'm going to talk a little bit about later on. There's a far deeper reason why we actually have these biases, some of them. And, and it's around our upbringing and what we've been taught about money and how we understand money. So very important that we, we just identify that. So how do we go, how do we avoid being caught by the sizzle? How do we make sure that we get steak and it's a steak we want and that we enjoy it? What do we do? Well. There are a couple of ways we can we can work at this, and one of them is to employ specialists, or to work with specialists, or to even just consult, do what you're doing, you know, go to talks, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, specialists like asset managers are going to be uh, um, dictated to by their processes, and their processes are hopefully very robust, so that if they do anything, it's measurable and it can be checked. And that the asset allocation process is good so that if Pinnacle does drop in the portfolio, it doesn't affect the entire portfolio because it isn't the entire portfolio. It's part of the portfolio. So, you know, that's important to, to, to know is maybe you should be working with or even just wealth managers because what they do is they help protect you from yourself. It's someone to bounce an idea off, you know, to, to work with. But what you've also got to remember is that asset managers – and if we're specifically going to focus on them, asset managers do not always beat their benchmarks. Now, how most asset managers work is they will work against a, a target because you want to measure them. You're paying a fee for it. You need to know I'm getting somewhere with it. And if you look at this slide, this is now the MSCI, the Morgan Stanley Composite Index, World Index. And it's showing you the percentage of act active managers that have outperformed that index over the years. And in each year, you know, how they did. And it doesn't go 13 and 14 are not sure. And in fact, 13 and 14 have probably been the hardest periods for managers, active managers, 
to, uh, to beat the benchmark. Uh, it's been a growth cycle market. Value managers particularly have been way behind uh, their benchmarks. And so, in fact, you were better off in the last two years actually being in, just tracking an index, just buying an index um, portfolio. But it does give you an idea that you, you need to understand that there's, that there's going to be times when they don't beat their benchmarks. Um, and the worldwide average is quite high in not beating your benchmark. So pick your manager carefully and work with them you know, if you're going to use them. The, the other thing to understand is that those managers, their speciality is obviously to help you, uh, you know, to guide you through the process and to invest for you if you want that. Uh, but they, you, you need to understand why you're using them. And some of the reason would be shown in this slide. If you look here, you can see here the statements. What this slide is showing you is that 20 stocks, um, the top 20 stocks in the, in the All Share Index last year, uh, you know, in terms of performance, how they contributed towards performance. And the top three alone contributed 4.6 of the 8.1% return of the Aussie last year. Okay, so those three stocks alone contributed more than half of the total return of the All Share Index last year, excluding dividends. Okay, that's the dividend aspect you add to it. So if you didn't have those three stocks in your portfolio, how did you do? Not so well. And in fact, in 2013, the Aussie did 18% before dividends, and three stocks contributed at 11.7, 11, I think was the, the mark, 11.7%. Three stocks contributed 11.7% of that return. So you have to ask yourself the question, okay, what stocks were they? How expensive were they already? You know, were they worth buying? What risk did you t would you take if you bought them? Or what risk did you take not having them? That's, those are the questions you have to ask. And asset managers obviously are going to play their part. Now, a value manager is going to say, sure, that's a great company, but it's, it's expensive. Uh, you know, I'm not going to buy it. And he won't, they won't have it, especially, and Simon alluded to it, you know, in, in the intro, uh, value managers such as Canon, that, that stock doesn't sit in our portfolios. It's not a deep value stock. And we're not saying it's not a great company. It's just, for us, not a good investment. So man managers are going to help you, you know, work out where the sizzle is in, in the investment. Now, this slide could really mislead you. Um, if you look at it, what it's saying is this, the five killer shares that you should have held for the past 10 years, if you'd invested 10,000 Rand in each of those stocks, you would have that much. It's not bad, eh? <laughs> not a bad amount. But what's interesting now is Pinnacle, I've mentioned it earlier, where is that now? Howden, at the moment, is taking a bit of a, a smack in the marketplace. They've just recently announced that for the foreseeable future, that probably won't pay dividends. So, you know, that's, that stock, that, that, that slide looks great, but it's five stocks we're talking about and it's hindsight. It's dangerous, you know, to, to it's almost irresponsible to show that, but, it's, but it's, it's something that we do see all the time. And sure, yes, if you've got very high conviction about certain stocks, well then hold a few, but boy, you're gonna have to go with the right, for the ride on that. You know, uh, most managers are gonna say, you want to hold 20 stocks in your portfolio, maybe 25. You know, most asset managers are going to be asset allocation, allocating on that basis. So there's sizzle on that completely uh, in that slide. Then if you look at, this slide is too uncomplicated, is just to look at the red dots. Because what this slide is telling you is, let's, let's talk about Aspen as a stock here. What it's saying is on the right hand side here are what the earnings before interest and tax need to be in terms of growth rate. And Aspen needs to grow its earnings by 30% a year for the next 10 years to justify its current price. Okay, that's quite a tall ask. Um, Nuspers is the same, it needs to grow its earnings by that much. So, you know, if you buy the stock, what you're doing is you're buying the belief that it's going to produce earnings and those earnings are going to be justified. You know, the price is going to be justified by the earnings. Very important to understand those factors. So there's certainly a lot of sizzle in, in the marketplace and this kind of information can help you. 
you know, if you if you like Naspers as a stock, great. I mean, it's possibly buck the trend and, and carry on doing well. But make sure you're also diversified, you know, in your portfolio. Make sure you've done that um, just, just to protect your, your investment. And what will managers do for you t on top of that? This is now looking at the markets basically today and the, the different sectors in the market. So you see there's the resource sector uh, running through here. We have financials. And then we have what we did in this side is just broke, broke industrials down into large cap industrials and SA industrials. And I think it tells its, the story. There's your cyclically adjusted price earnings back to 1986. Okay, so where the market was sitting. And what it's telling you is that large cap industrials have run very strongly. They're way above the average. Okay. And resources is lagging far behind. Or resources are lagging far behind. Please understand that we're not saying that resources is... is you, you jump in there. There's certain issues around resources. And we've had quite a, a challenge over the last year, particularly with the resource sector. We've had dollar strength. We've had labor issues. We've had the demand in China reducing considerably as China turns itself into a consumer-based economy. So, you know, um, resources have come off on that basis. But it's certainly the sector that's looking the most attractive uh, out, of the, out of all of the sectors. But what's also quite interesting about this is it's not really showing these sectors as being hugely overpriced, although our markets run. So what's pulled our market is large cap industrials. That's what's pulled our market up. And sure, if there's a movement in the market and it's the wrong way, if we don't want it to happen, it's a possibility that that's where it starts. That's the catalyst uh, in the market. But we'll have to see what happens. You know, America's recovering uh, at the moment, but not the rest of the world's not recovering as well. So we'll have to see, you know, how it plays out. Our major trading partner is still Europe. So, and Europe's battling. You know, there's certainly troubles in, in Europe. So important to, to understand that. But that's where specialists come in to give you this kind of information. And so when you're investing, I think it's important that you, you acknowledge that the more information you can get, the better, um, you know, just to help you make good decisions. What we did here was we broke the market down just into some stocks. And once again, we used the CAPE ratio. And, you know, what we're showing you is just trend lines. Um, so you can see Mr. Price is a stock. Uh, you know, it's, it's had a, I mean, it's a fantastic company, Mr. Price. Run up. And in fact, the trend line was this way. It's actually carried on going. Um, once again, you know, that company has to produce the earnings to justify it's the, the price of the stock. In recent times, uh, I've been watching, I mean, Naspers, Mr. Price, Aspen, stocks like that. And I mean, Aspen, I mean, Naspers went through the roof. It's come back a bit. They have retracted a bit. But, you know, fantastic companies. So let's see what happens. Uh, the, the best thing that could happen is that we're not affected badly by any changes, isn't, isn't it? It'd be nice if it just calm down a bit eh? <laughs> and we could we could experience a, a soft you know soft landing or approach to it but very important for us to to understand that this kind of information is not always easy to get your hands on uh, you know it's it, you have to go to specialists at times to find it and then this this is a um, a fantastic filtering tool which asset managers will use to try and determine whether there's been any kind of fraud um, in financial statements. In fact, it applies to a number of things. But let me start off by telling you who Benford was. Uh, Benford was a physicist. In 1938, he was working for uh, General Electric. And he happened to be looking at the pages, um, logarithm pages for low numbers. And he noticed that the pages for the lowest numbers were the most worn. In other words, they'd been turned to the most often. And in fact, the number one was the most worn. So he decided then, let me go and investigate this further. And he started studying a number of different data sets, but random data sets, um, naturally established data sets. In other words, there was no manipulation in the data. And he worked out a theory, a logarithmic theory, which which is now used uh, around the world. In fact, it's admissible in court for evidence. 
It was used in the Iranian elections in 2009 to determine voter fraud. They picked up voter fraud. So it's a, it's a very well-known tool. And how does it work? Well, if you take this example, you'll see that what we've done is we've just taken the value 100, and we've taken a number of years, 33 years, and every year we've just inflated it by 15%. Okay? And what his theory what his theory worked out was that the number the, the, the leading digit, the leading digit, so that first digit there, would be a number one 33 percent 30.3% of the time. It should be a number one 30.3% of the time. You would think that it wouldn't be like that. There's there's one to nine in the scale, and you would think it would be evenly distributed. So you think 11.1, 11.1% of each. It actually doesn't work like that. So I'm talking about non-manipulated numbers, okay? Um, and that you would have in this set, there's six twos, um, and in fact, the eights and nines would be very low as the leading digit. You would see there's only one there, one there. So what ended up happening was it was evolved further from there. And this is actually, sorry, this is what his distribution looks like. So that's what his law says. It's so a logarithmic scale. It's not, it's not evenly distributed. It's non-evenly distributed. So the one should appear as a leading digit around 30% of the time, two around 16, 17% of the time, and a nine around 5% of the time. So where is this useful? Well, when you manipulate numbers, this is, his law is a natural uh, law. When you manipulate numbers, what ends up happening is this goes out of kilter. So you find that the ones drop and you know you might have a nine coming up. So a, an example would be, let's say you, you've got a, you have a business and you've allowed one of your staff members to write checks to a certain level without second authorization. So let's say it's 50,000 Rand. I know that would be a huge amount, but what you would want to do is then check all of those slips to see if the four and a nine came up as the first and second digit often enough. Because if there's any fraud, it would be happened in 49,999, 49,800, 49,000. That's where you would find it. And so that's where it became very useful. It's used in a number of things, uh, lengths of rivers, um, street addresses. That same theory applies. Where there's no manipulation of the numbers, it should, that, that, that um, logarithmic progression should actually occur across the board. So I've, what I've done is, in fact, if you want, the, I've photostated some of his information. You can take it away. It'll help you to understand it a bit further. And if you want to Google it, you'll find a lot of information on Benford. But it's a filtering tool that, I mean, we've used in, in, in our business. And it's just to, to pick up, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll show you example, an example now. This is a company, African Cellular Towers. In 2011, you looked at their financials you actually could see that there was something wrong with them. Um, so, you know, it really didn't fit the Benford scale. So now, now you're going to start looking further. What's happened here? You know, why has this happened? You're going to ask questions. Uh, that, that's really the process you're going to follow. And then Meta in 2011 actually was a, a pretty good match. Meta is a fantastic business. I mean, you might might have followed it. Some, some of you might know it. Uh, we actually still got to have it in our portfolios. It's a really good business. But it just gives you an idea of one simple little tool that is so effective that it is now admissible as evidence in the USA. I mean, that's amazing. Um, so if anyone ever says to you, my tax is good and I'm honest, so can I see your tax returns? <laughs> you can work it out, for them, see if they, if they have been. Uh, so yes, uh, uh, Benford, uh, definitely a theory that is well worth uh, um, knowing about. If you're going to go, if you're going to use specialists, really what we encourage you to do is understand what to ask in terms of questions of an asset manager, what to look for when you're going to specialists. Now let's focus on asset managers, seeming seem as I'm, I am from one. Uh, I think the first thing you need to ask the question, so because you can really also be caught up by the sizzle here. So here are some questions that you might want to ask. The first one is about the people. How qualified are they? I mean, you really want to know that these people are, you know, know what they're doing. How are they paid? Do they, are they paid a performance bonus? 
is that actually ideal? Is a performance bonus an ideal thing if you're paying someone to manage your money over a long period of time? Because they might be forced every year to push a bit harder to try and pick up their performance bonus. What's, what style of investing are they investing in? And, and is, that, is that commensurate to a performance bonus? Because a value manager, a deep value manager, says, I need your money for a long period of time. I, I don't think you'd want a value manager to be on a performance bonus. But you might want a stockbroker who you're just buying and selling with. Maybe you want that, you know. But that, those are important facts. And, and education, in our industry, you actually can't, you can't be in an asset management without that anymore. In fact, wealth management, financial planning, it's all being cleaned up in terms of skill. So that's, that's good for everyone. It's good for the investors. The second thing you want to know is uh, philosophy. And what I mean by that, and, and, and Simon alluded to it earlier, there are a number of different styles of investing. You have deep value, you have growth, you have momentum, there are all these different styles. There's growth at a reasonable price. Um, there's derivatives of every one of them. But the most important thing is how strong is the conviction of that asset manager? Well, in other words, will they stick to it? Because if you're going to them for the style, you want them to stick to the style. If you like value as an investment philosophy, you understand it, you know that the, the companies you, that are bought in by a value investor pay high, high dividends, they trade on low price earnings, their price to book values, which is a terminology is low, you know, and you want them to stick to that. And uh, if, they, if they waver from it, then they're not really a deep value manager. I think you've got to, you know, you've got to identify that. And the other thing you've got to do is identify in that management company, how much influence do the leaders have? How, how big is that team of investment managers? Do they get together and have a, a decent bosperat, you know, really iron out the stock they're going to buy? Is there one guy in that place who just has so much influence that in actual fact the others are just there for numbers? Or is it really you know, done by a fair ballot, um, even ballot, equal ballot? It's very important, I think, for you to ask those questions. Process is vital. It's probably one of the most vital things. You want to know that your asset manager follows a specific process for every single stock that they buy and that it's measurable. Because if something goes wrong, you want to be able to go back and say, what went wrong? What did you do differently in your process that this went wrong? That's important. And maybe just as an individual investors, it's also an important thing. If you can develop, if you, if you don't use managers, if you just want to do it yourselves, do it the same way every time. Because you, you have a, the opportunity then to go back and say, something went wrong here. What did I... Did I do something wrong in the process? Develop your own process, you know, your own way of investing. And then performance. Now, performance is the fourth one. I know we would all want it to be the first one because <laughs> we look for performance first, don't we? But I think what's important to understand is if you come in and you invest at a company like Canon, Canon gives you deep value, all right? At a certain point in time, deep value is not going to perform like growth or like momentum. In fact, that would be the reason why you would be buying it, because you want the diversification in your portfolio. So you're going to go and you're going to say, right, I want to invest in the market. I don't. I love value as a style, but I, I'm also going to be wise about this. Let me diversify. So you buy a value manager and a momentum manager together. You can't expect them then to return at the same level. And that's going to be hard to deal with because psychologically, when the momentum manager is shooting the lights out and the value manager is not, you're going to go, I want the momentum manager only. And that's when you've got to be very strong in your conviction. And that's where you need maybe someone holding your hand just saying, listen, remember, the plan was this, to double check you and protect you, protect you from yourself, you know, in terms of your investment philosophy. So performance is important. But if the manager and the style you've picked doesn't match the performance, then they're not managing according to that style. Okay, so you've got to be uh, in the marketplace at the moment, deep value around the world actually is battled. Uh, any value manager who hasn't really battled maybe has drifted a bit. Maybe they're not a deep value manager. You know, so those are the kinds of things you've got to ask. 
administrative in- excellence is important, and I think we take this as standard. But you know, to become an asset manager from a licensing point of view, uh, what you've got to put in place is, I mean, you, you're so protected in that sense. Um, so the administration process is followed, the software packaging behind, you know, package that's, that runs your investment, the reporting that comes to you, uh, all of that, you need to ask the question, what do you use? Who do you use? Uh, do they use a developed package or are they just using Excel spreadsheets? You know, Excel is fantastic. Geez, and I don't think we ever use it as much as it can offer, but is that ideal? So those are the kinds of things you you need to to know. And then I think this is probably the most important, is does the manager eat his cooking? Does he eat his steak? Or does he sell you sizzle or not eat his steak? In other words, does he invest in his own pot? It's all very well to be the owner of the business, but do you invest in the portfolios that your clients are invested in? That you must ask the question of. So that lead manager, some of the asset managers don't have lead managers. They do it in a team. So it's quite hard to identify the one guy and say, what do you invest? But you can ask the team, right, how much of your wealth do you put in your own, you know, your own investments that you manage for me? It's an important question to ask. And you always want to do what they're doing, don't you? I mean, they, they should know. They've got to have a bit of knowledge. So you always want to be doing that, you know. So... Uh, just identify, make sure that you get that, you know, you get that right. And the, let's let's move on from let's move on from now the specialists and let's look at other aspects that we can you know we can use to help ourselves. Uh, one thing we must do is is we must understand that we need to look around before we make an investment. Uh, and what I mean by that is, if you looked at the reason why people bought into ShareMax. Possibly it was out of necessity. But what what they could have done maybe is looked at what the market was paying in interest at the time, comparatively, and said, hey, maybe there's an issue here. Tannenbaum is another story. I mean, Tannenbaum is offering you 15% a quarter. Why weren't the banks jumping into that and buying it? Why wasn't he going to the banks and borrowing money from the banks, rather, and, and investing? Because <laughs> they, they weren't going to give it to him. They knew. So... There's actually information all the time. There's red flags all the time. But you have to ask the questions and you have to look around. So read a lot and be aware because then you get a good feel for what the market feels like. I mean, if you're going to buy a property, what you, the ideal thing is to, to do is to say, I pick an area, let me go and get used to what property prices are like in that area and what, prop, what you get for your money. And then you develop a sense. And then you invest. That's the, that's the, the prudent way of doing it. So, yeah, you know, there's always a, and I think the excuse, and, I, and, and this is not meant to be totally direct, but we, can't, we have to take responsibility for our own decisions. We really do. So if you're going to go to a specialist, you must develop the feeling within you that you're ultimately responsible for this. That means you're going to have to ask them lots of questions. They need to educate you well enough that you can feel that you have enough knowledge to make a decision. They're going to advise you, guide you, but you've got to, you press the button. And ultimately, the buck stops with you, doesn't it? I mean, you, you end up sitting with the growth or the loss. So if we can develop that sort of thinking of, let me take responsibility for this entirely, it, you are so empowered by that. And the only way you can do that is to speak to you, you know, people enough. And we do force a sizzle at times as individuals. I mean, this slide, you know, it, it tells you the story. There's our expectation, but there's our budget sometimes. Um, so, so we force it, you know, because we want return and we, so we push the managers and we, you know, I don't like that stock that you're holding. Um, but they've probably got a very good reason why they're holding that specific stock. Find out why, you know, and if, if you don't like it, move from the manager, you know, uh, important, those are important, uh, factors. What else do we, what else can we do? Well, we really need to look inwards. So we need, we need to avoid investing uh, out of necessity, out of greed. We need to invest unemotionally, and that's not always easy. And I've spoken to you, there are many biases. But let me give you an example of you know, what can happen to us in life that can force us into decision-making processes that are not ideal. Let's say two boys are born into a family, and through their life, their father 
continually says to them when they approach him for anything, he continually says, listen, I, we can't afford that. No, that cricket bat, you know, no, we, we're not going to get it for you. No, sorry, you, you know, it's really not going to happen. We can't afford it. And, the, and the, what happens with those children is their perception develops around that. And they grow up with this perception that I'm not good enough or I'm not deserving. Because the dad's told them you can't afford it. In actual fact, how they're perceiving it is, I'm not worthy enough. I'm not good enough to receive this. What ends up happening with those two boys, possibly, and, and this has happened, so it's, it's a theoretical example, but it's happened. The first boy grows up and he has nothing. He really literally has nothing. He believes he, ha he is nothing and he has nothing. The second does the opposite. He has everything. He goes out and he makes a fortune and he keeps going and he's never enough and just keeps going. But both of them still have the same problem. They both believe they're worth nothing. They're trying to prove that they're worth something. And so within that psychology, there's a fault. Now, maybe a Bernie Madoff comes out of that second guy. Maybe it comes out of that. So please understand that when we're doing this, we need to make sure that we are made up of emotion, uh, that we have perceptions from our childhood that could drive us to make decisions that are not ideal. And so, you know, uh, uh, try and broaden your knowledge, be around a lot of people, speak to a lot of people. It's the best way of, of, of avoiding that. And then the last thing is diversification. And I think probably this is probably one of the most important ways of securing or giving you the best risk-adjusted performance. Diversification, if you've got an asset manager, they're going to say to you, right, there's 25 stocks in your portfolio. Look, they might have a 10-stock portfolio, their best ideas, but you've got to understand what you're buying with that. And they'll tell you, you know, in detail. The reason why they're doing that is because they want to avoid the fact that Pinnacle Technologies takes that knock and it's in the portfolio, possibly. That's what they're trying to do. So they're diversifying for that reason. But you as the investor have a lot of ways you can diversify. You can diversify that way. You can diversify in regions, so geographically. But the main reason why you want to diversify is you don't want two assets to move the same way all the time. Because when they're going up, you're going to feel great. But when they're going down, both of them are going down. So it's going to affect you emotionally, but it's also going to give you a poor risk-adjusted return, which is what you're in the market for. You want them to be doing this. That's what you want. And if you look up the definition of diversification, you'll see that this is stated as part of it um, in, in Investopedia. Um, but diversification strives to smooth out unsystematic risk events in a portfolio. Um, and that's really what you're trying to achieve in it. You know, maybe if you're prepared to sit it out and you, and, and you hold onto stock for 30 years or 40 years, go for the ride and you're gonna do very well. And you can have you know, a handful of stocks, but how many people, I don't know many people that are prepared to wait 40 years. We are instant gratification people. The whole idea behind investing is to do that, but we battle to do it. So very important that you know, we consider diversification. So really, at the end of the day, I think, what we need to understand is that there's sizzle in everything, but we, there's ways of looking through it. That if we do, we manage to find out how to do that and we manage ourselves properly, we will have that stake. We'll find that stake. Uh, and we'll have our investment taste buds satisfied. So go out there and enjoy the investing, but please grow your knowledge and understand and understanding of yourselves, and it'll help you in your investing. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions?